Chapter 10, Events Turn for the Worst One could hardly think such a few people who profess the fear of God could act and react in the way as I am to show through the following events. The following is a summary of those events which caused me to see how things at Beerton were going from bad to worse. Prayer meeting, 26th of October, 1983. Mr King read from uh, Jeremiah's prophecy, chapter 33, and emphasised verse 3 after a few comments on the reading. Following this, I was to read from Ezekiel's prophecy, chapter 14. However, this is what happened. I made introductory remarks before my selected reading, and the effect of my words was such that four of the seven gathered got up and walked out of the meeting. I was astonished, and so were the remaining members who were Mrs Gurney, Miss Bertha Ellis. This had never been known to happen in the history of the Beaton Church. The following is a recollection of the words spoken at that time, none of which were designed to hurt or cause the effects as has been mentioned. They were spoken from the heart and with all honesty and truth as the subject lay heavily upon my spirit, particularly after recent events at the church at Beerton and after receiving the letter from Mr John Gosden, which at that time none of the church members had read, save Mr King. The chapter 14 of Ezekiel seems to speak to us at Beerton, and I as a minister of the gospel felt responsible to convey those things which I believed the living God would have us take note of. Before the appointed reading took place, I took the liberty to make the following introductory comments. Ezekiel 14, the text of scripture, which Mr King had emphasised, was a very good word to the people of God, and to any seeking him. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I too could testify the truth of these words, having experienced the truth of these words in my own case, for when the Lord Jesus called me by grace fourteen years ago, I was in no church, nor was I brought up in things which were known to others who from a child had known the scriptures. But the truth of the words called upon me, and I will answer thee, was true in my case. For I called upon the name of the Lord, and he heard my cry, and saved me, separated me from my former ways and manner of living, being once a drug taker, criminal and wicked person. Only the power of the gospel and constraining grace of the Lord Jesus Christ could work in such a way overnight. Being called in no church, nor brought up in any church, my knowledge of the Lord Jesus came as I read the Bible. I met in those days, after touring the churches here and there, I was unable to settle in any of the churches. The reason being, I could not find that concern to know God and his grace in the way taught through the doctrines of grace and as they are found in the Lord Jesus Christ, and as I had come to receive. They neither taught them nor believed, as I had come to know myself. I had read in those days accounts of John Kershaw's life, John Warburton, William Huntington, and later William Gadsby, all men with whom I believed I had something in common. We had experienced the same things in measure, believed the same truths of God's word, but I knew no church in those days who knew these things as I had received. That is until the Beaton Church was made known to me. As you know, I crept in and sat at the back and continued with you until this day. At that time, the reverence for the things of God and manner of worship was well-pleasing and pleasant. The singing of the hymns was savoury, their theme always being that of the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel of grace. The hymns spoke of free grace, justification by faith, imputed righteousness and the sovereignty of God in all things. These doctrines I had come to receive before coming among you. Now, believing I had been called by the Lord Jesus to preach his gospel and given leave of the church I must speak and can only speak of those things God hath shown me from his word. My responsibilities to you and your responsibilities to me as a preacher, and also our responsibilities to Mr King as a preacher, are the same. I ask you, if I speak not according to the word of God, you must show me. Take me aside and show me, and I appeal for you to do so. Nevertheless, since it is a truth 
But in general, a prophet is not received amongst his own people. The prophet Ezekiel needs no commendation. Let him speak the words applicable to us, and may his word be believed, and the spirit who dictated the words speak to our hearts as appropriate. Having now been among you these several years, I am now discovering that not only here, but in as I travel churches, things that I must make known. Recently, it has been brought to my attention, when a minister, or you people refer to the house of God, you actually mean the building. I have never understood our ministers to actually mean the building, for they mean the church, the elect, called out body of Christ. As I read the scripture, I find the house of God, the place or seat of worship according to the First Testament, was destroyed by the hand of God, as foretold by Jesus when speaking of the temple, saying, Not one stone shall be left upon another. God is no longer worshipped in one place or temple. That all of those forms and ordinances of worship under the First Testament were all but types of the substance of true gospel worship and the true church order now revealed in the New Testament. Now, the temple of God is the people of God, lively stones, and not by man's doings, but by the regenerating work of God the Spirit. The elect body of Christ, called to be saints, are the true building of God, the house of God and not the chapel building, which I discover is believed to be the case today. All the vessels in the Old Testament were typical of the elect people of God set apart for divine use, types of officers, helps, functioning members of the church of Christ's gospel church. We are the temple of God. New Testament worshippers have no holy tables, no tables of God, no holy temples, as I have been recently told. I am told the communion table must be reverence, for it is a holy table set apart unto God. The building, I am told, is to be reverenced, for it is the house of God, all of which I discover to be not found in the word of God. At this point, a member of the church called out and asked, Well, is this not the house of God pointed to the building? Then another rose to their feet, saying, This is more like a church meeting, and walked out. This followed by three more people leaving. They were Miss G. Ellis, Mr. A. King, Mrs. G. Everett. The other person was a member of the congregation. This left myself and two members behind. I was amazed and alarmed, for I had not raised my voice, nor spoken in a severe way, or a hard way. Nevertheless, I had provoked this reaction by speaking the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. I beckoned to the remaining few that I should close the meeting in prayer and asked the Father of our Lord Jesus to save his people from these troubles and to give us wisdom in these days and how we should conduct ourselves. I then spoke to the two remaining, asking them to do what they believe to be right. They need not trouble themselves over me, but rather themselves. If they feel I should leave them, I would do so. If this would bring peace, or if they felt a minister of the gospel should speak to me to show me the errors of my ways, then they must do so. I then indicated to them, from the word of God, the scriptures, that clearly teaches the house of God to be the church. 1 Timothy 3 verse 15 We left Beaton Chapel heavy in heart, but I trusted with our eyes towards heaven that God would be gracious and appear for the people of God. I then recalled my dream and wondered, were these people them in my dream? And after all, was there anything in dreams at all?